Episode number eight takes you inside the inner workings and leadership of our volunteer firefighters. You will see over 30 memorable fire photos, some going back over 40 years ago. When I was a kid, you oftentimes would have a barn fire, maybe, and you would always know where it was, you know, because it was so much open land at the time, so many farms around it. The way they were called back then, you have to, it's, it's really strange because if the fire whistle went off, okay, we could hear it because we lived in town. We had a list of people to call on the phone. That was the only time I was allowed to use the phone and it was a party line. Our next door neighbor, the Kings, were on the party line and I can remember distinctly calling up, picking up the, the receiver and saying there's, there's a fire, the fire whistle's going and they would immediately hang up because they knew I had to make all these phone calls to alert firemen who were down on old lime killed pike or couldn't hear the fire whistle. There were no, you know, there was no other way to communicate other than by a phone. You didn't have pagers or anything like that. That's how they communicated. So what to was, get people to get to the fire company. So what would that be, the, the 1950s? No. Yeah. No, it even lasted longer than that. I know when I first moved um, in with uh, George and, uh, uh, with George Carlin and Jane Carlin, uh, they still had the bell system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The bell system oh, yeah. were in certain houses. Right. Where the phone company would activate the bell, and then those folks would get on the phone and call people. They had predetermined people to call. Well, that was after the system that I yeah. was talking about. Exactly. I mean, I was really young, because I yeah. remember this. Yeah. Because I moved from downtown Chalfont when I was in second grade. Yep. Second or third grade. So I wasn't very old. I was not allowed to touch the phone, only in those circumstances. Yep. Was I allowed to use that phone so I could call firefighters? And that was the only way that they had of calling them in when they couldn't hear the fire whistle. I mean, how, how far did the fire whistle go? Not very far. Right. So every week there was a list that you knew who was local in town. To well, you knew it all the time. You knew it. You knew it, it, it didn't change. It didn't change unless there was a new member. It, it was there by the phone, and there were people I had to call. Don't ask me who they were. I can't remember. But at that point, there was, you know, my number was 0849. So there were only four numbers I had to call. Okay. That was it, 0849. That was my number. That was our number in the house. So I had to dial four numbers to get to the next person. But, Joe, the standard procedure was if you heard the fire siren, you went to the firehouse. Yeah. It's still that way. If you hear a fire siren, it doesn't make any difference if it's during the day or in the evening or the middle of the morning or uh, late at night, you went to the fire station. It didn't make any difference if you were having holiday dinner uh, or Thanksgiving dinner and how many times did that happen, right? You just went. That's right. You didn't ask. And if you were working, if you, if you heard about it and you could go, you would went. But it all depended. Like in Joe's case, in my case, I was working in Philadelphia. Now Taffy might call me and say, you got a big fire, like Hartzell's was one. So when I came home, I just went to the firehouse. <laughs> well, yeah, it was just one of those things. I will tell you, he spent many an hour at the fire company. Yeah. Be it, be it on the ambulance, he's holder of the David Burpee Award um, for his service. Uh, he just, What's the David Burpee Award? Um, volunteer. Um, at that time, it was emergency responders. I don't know how it's branched out now. 
Um, and I don't think it's David Burpee anymore. I think it's the Burpee Family Award. Well, it's still given today. The uh, Central Bucks uh, Chamber, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, currently sponsors it. But at the time, it was uh, set up because of um, uh, one of the, uh, the EMTs. Uh, actually, it was Linda Goodwin. At that time, her son was killed um, in, in an emergency I issue, and she started that award. Um, and she was involved with it till the chamber took it over, and they still do it today. So it's a firefighter of the year, EMS of the year, EMS responder. Yeah. And there's a banquet usually in October. Yeah. You went to right. <clears throat> so you were both fire and EMS. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. He was a volunteer on the ambulance. Oh, he was yeah. not. I didn't like to drive. I stayed clear <laughs> of drive. And the other important thing was the radio. You had to be on the radio. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, yeah. And you had to run the siren and the horn. <laughs> That's an important job, too. You realize the driver's driving, but the person next to him is operating the horn and the sirens and keeping an eye on everything. It's a big job. Yeah. I remember one morning we had a fire, but... About the middle of the night, we were, and at that time, Art was driving. Mm. He was driving, and I was riding shotgun, and we were going up through town. Not a soul around anywhere. And he said, "Blow the siren!" I said. What why why blow the siren? There's nobody around. He says, oh, I have to get up. Everybody gets up. <laughs>
but eventually <laughs> you fight and you argue, and but usually you work things out, and uh, you learn to work with everybody here. And and I think the reason the fire company lasted long was is because of people that were running that had to have respect and understanding and some kindness. And uh, I think that's one of the main things. You didn't have to be fire smart. You had to be people smart. You had to learn how people were and how to, you know, that's how you learn to treat them. And, you know, that's what kept them around. I think we were fortunate that there was a lot of businesses in town, a lot of people actually worked in town were allowed to leave their work to go to fire. And that's when Tripper was in business down there. We got five or six guys out there every time the whistle blew, which was really a big help to the fire company. Sam, he would run it from his office. When the whistle blew, I left Mark's garage. I came from Asheville. Uh, you asked Bike Asheville, County. The Bike County. And a lot of businesses have helped to actually allow the fire company to continue because they allowed the people to leave work, which made it work. <laughs> so it was, a, it was always been a good, strong community support then. Yes, it had. A couple of the municipalities, they would uh, let their men come out, like New Britain Township. We had four guys at one time on the road crew. Chalfont Borough would let the one guy come out that was a member someplace else, but he came out during the daytime. Well, I have to tell you why I joined the fire company in the first place back in the 60s. And I moved in, and I was a stranger in town. Bought a house over on Boyer Road. And one night the fire was went off and I looked out the window and up the street there was a house on fire. So I went up there and just as I got there, uh, Bill Vaughn, who I will mention some names, but any names I mention became lifelong friends as a result of being in the fire company. And he was carrying a little boy out. And so I thought, uh, I think this may be something I want to get involved in. And so Dick Shaper, who was my neighbor, up the street, I asked him how I to get in to become a member of the Shelf Life Fire Company. And he says, Well, you have to have a sponsor, and I'll sponsor you. Okay. And so uh, we went to the meeting, and, and at that time it was it was tough. I mean, you were in with all native born Shelf Life people who grew up together, they raced cars together, they knew each other, and all of a sudden in comes a stranger. <laughs> and so we got to find out what he's all about, you know what I mean? And so you just had to prove yourself. I mean, you're not coming in there and you're going to change this and change that because there were written rules and bylaws, but then there were also unwritten rules of things that you did and things that you didn't do. And so if you got out of hand, um, the worst thing that could happen to you is that you would be in invited to a cheese meeting <laughs> once a month. And you know if you're going in there, there's trouble. <laughs> and so people belong to the fire company. They wanted to be there. And so they would do anything to keep keep them. But one thing that kept the an unwritten rule that kept the fire company together, and that was John Greenley, because he was <laughs> there all the time. If you did something wrong, Still you'd is. hear about it. If you did something right, you'd also hear about it. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, man. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that went a long way. To be successful, you had to be around all the time. Yeah. That's how you, had, yeah. that's how you were successful. Thursday night was fire company night. And unless your wife was giving birth to another <laughs> child or something, maybe you would still be there. But uh, that was just an unwritten law. You Thursday night, we're going to practice and we're going to make sure next time the fire goes off, you're going to know what to do. Talk about the auxiliary. They they support when the firemen are are out fire for a while, or we we do. Um, we hold fundraisers and then um, present the money that we've raised throughout the year at the annual banquet. First. First, the first person, there, the first officer there, is to assess and take a you know a, a look around the place, 360 around the whole property, and and uh, basically see what the exposures are and what's burning and what they might and how much water they might need or how much help they might need. Yes, they assess this all in a couple short minutes, and uh, then when the first truck comes, the the first crews off the truck will take you know a line. And, you know, and the officer that's there would guide them to where they 
need to go, whether it be the front door or a ladder to the, you know, ladder in the second floor and go through a window or, you know, so. I think what you're saying, every, every call is different. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, every call is absolutely different. There's no, no two alike. A lot of training, a lot of years of training. First in officer also assesses whether anybody's still in the building or not. That's the most important thing that he has to determine. The momentous fire uh, that I can recall was uh, St. Jude's Church. Got on the truck when we got there. It wasn't the library. It was a sanctuary. Uh, a f a no fellow fighter, fellow firefighter, and myself were sitting, or right in the front of the church, streaming a hose through where the stained glass windows were. Uh, whenever the fire was knocked down, we decided to go in and see if there were any hot spots. Well, we're going in the one side door and one of the parishioners says, be very, very careful because the organ is up on the balcony. Well, when we walked in, there was no balcony. The organ was on the floor in front of us. And we went through putting out hot spots uh, throughout the, the sanctuary area. and. Uh, the, the fire was so intense, it burned the pews down to probably 10 or 12 inches from the floor. Because they were all wood, they all burned, except about 12 inches off of the floor. And uh, the uh, cause that they determined was the, uh, the sacrificial candles that they burned when people say prayers and things like that. It was in a certain part of the church, and just the heat from the candles after, I think it was maybe like 20 years set it on fire and uh, the whole whole building burned. Uh, yeah, they, they get dispatched the same way and they come out with it whenever it's a fire call to come out. When, if you're available, you come out and uh, help direct traffic mainly. Whatever else is needed, traffic or people, traffic. Crowds, there could be big crowds. Yeah, There's almost always somebody uh, lingering around, trying to trying to get around back to take a picture or whatever. Can't let them do it. That's all. You have any memories of problems you had to solve with people getting too close to a fire, watching it, or? Yeah, I remember Diane. It's a plane accident up in uh, Hilltown. Plane accident. Her putting a uh, holding a sheet up so people couldn't take pictures from far away. Or whatever. On Saturday afternoon, many years ago. And one of the things I like to say about the fire police too is, is and, and we've always been very lucky because Chaplin's always had probably the most fire police in the entire area, right. one of the biggest, largest crew yeah. who have stuck here the longest. You know, so I think that says a lot because they spend a lot of time far away from home now on shutdown roads or fire scenes, you know, so they really give a lot more time. So, <laughs> Firehouse is a very diff difficult place at times to be. But the, the people who have a lot of years are sitting here you know, are more, tough it, people. It was more that way than it is now. Difficult to be a, the, an engineer here yeah. You're in the 80s. Hard to get into the position. Yeah. Nobody there was a lot of when I first came. There were seventy-five active people, and you you had a fight to get a spot on the truck. Yeah. Nineteen eighty-six come along, and laws changed, and you were no longer allowed to ride the back of the truck, and the membership has dwindled since. <laughs> it's kind of funny how like, it almost seems like that was something that was a big deal, but back to being an engineer. If you want to be an engineer here, you when you how to be tested, you know, where everything is on the compartment, you know, everything basically about the truck. You got drilled by all the chiefs. Any question they could think of, sometimes <laughs> it'd be an hour. And it was, it was, uh, if you knew the truck, it wasn't a big deal, but it just in itself was very intimidating. <laughs> you know, because... You had Kurt, John. Yeah. Yeah. But we used to take them out on the street. That way you're 
Jim Bowen Avenue. Avenue. What Jim Bowen Avenue? I mean, it's the street that goes Maple like that. Maple Avenue. The Maple Avenue. And you made him stop the truck in the middle of that hill and get started again. When would they ever see something like that? <laughs> and they were stick shifts then. Yeah. Yeah. They were stick shifts. No, oh, yeah. Nobody can drive a stick shift in this company now. <laughs> when was that? Back in the 60s? Or? Uh, 70s. Up to the 70s. 70s. Oh, that was. Uh, I was an engineer then, so it was in the 80s. It was in the 80s. The last day was Even into the 90s. The last day was a truck we had was in uh, 78. Every truck uh, was a shift. 78 or 79 Mac. Yeah, Mac was the last day was a truck. Mac with the real. Yeah, that was the last stick shift truck. Yeah. The, la the last truck I tested on was with Kurt Martin. And for some reason, the trucks were lined up on Railroad Avenue. <coughs> and he made me parallel park between the two trucks. <laughs> And I did it on the first shot. I still don't know how I did it. <laughs> One thing we all learned if you were around during the daytime, and John was the chief, you get in there, get it done, let's go back to work. That's right. You didn't play games, you did the job, and returned to work. Your normal work. Uh, Almost yeah. everybody here was around 24 yeah. hours a day, seven days a week, or worked in the, you know, so. Right. And it was a different game during the day. Things yeah. were completely different rules from the day to night. Everybody had a job. Yeah. <laughs> we had a house fire in Brittany Farms, bedroom and contents. And we, he decided he was going to fight it from outside. So we got a ladder up. He grabs the hose line, takes it up. Engineer can't get water. So there's a few curse words coming down <laughs> from the second floor. And the next thing, he's coming down the ladder, going across the front lawn yelling at the engineer like hell. Walks over, fires the truck up, gets water in the hose, goes back up the ladder and puts the fire out. Right. Nothing made me more mad if I couldn't get water. God, they used to make me mad. So when I, when I became an engineer, I, I promised myself two things. One, I wasn't going to miss any shifts. And second, I was never going to wait for John for water. <laughs> So I would, I've been an engineer maybe five, six years, and we had a, we had a, a little Chevy, and we went up to a big fuel fire up above the lake. Well, the lake wasn't there then, I don't yeah, think. No. And we ended up putting two hose lines together, two, uh, <clears throat> two of the uh, booster lines together. And he said, I'm ready for water. And I couldn't get water out of the truck. <laughs> And I thought, oh, Christ. So I told him, I said, something's wrong. I said, I can't get water. Nothing's wrong with the damn truck. <laughs> I said, okay. So down over the hill he comes. He tries to get water. He can't get water out of the truck. <laughs> Tank was dry, right? <laughs> no. Here, the valve on the water, on the fill, from the pump, from the tank to the, to the uh, pump, came unhitched. <laughs> So he had to climb under there, he fixes it up, and he says, there, he says, don't touch it. <laughs> so then he went back up, supervised the fire. I, you were chief then, I think. I don't remember. <laughs>
and I asked Sam to come up and take me out driver training, and he gets to the station and realizes we're going out in this one. <laughs> it was a little cold. <laughs> oh, yeah. He thought we were going out in one of the caps. Yeah. Uh, we used to go down Main Street <laughs> when, we, when we were allowed to ride on the back of the truck, and we'd take the spotlights here and shine them on the street lights and put all the street lights out <laughs> all the way up and down Main Street. He used to get so damn mad he could see straight. They were funny days because there was one, one cop in town. Today and he went, to bed, he went to he <laughs> shut he, he shut down at midnight. I, I do have one. I went. I had testify. I think testify on an arson case where I, when I was a deputy chief up at the high point, disgruntled employee came back in the middle of the night, set two or three fires in the building, and uh, and uh, left. And uh, we got called for an alarm there, and uh, we had one, you know these fires burn. We put them out. There wasn't a ton of damage, but the building was massive. It's gone now. It was a massive building, and it was very difficult to get the smoke out of it. And uh, you know, it turns out they did investigate, and they, they they caught who it was. And uh, I, mean, I had to go testify against them in court. He had busted up the whole place. He tore the place apart and then tried. He was smart because he lit the fires in a sprinkler building in the sprinkler system, put the fire out, but it had smoke. A lot of damage. A lot of yeah. 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 Smoke damage. Worst of it is, is when I was sitting there ready to testify, and I, you know, I, I look at, look, I really looked at him really close, and I looked at the family, and I realized I knew his mother. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I was like Rodney Dangerfield. You know, when I testify, put my collars a little tight. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good call for our good company. Get called for everything. They get call for we get call for anything and everything. Always was like that. Another big fire for the fire company was a Wanawick farm, which was up on Sellersville Road on the other side of New Galena. And there too, uh, they had uh, pigs right under the overshoot, like and all. And I remember Lee King. It was Easter Sunday, and he had a brand new suit on. And in those times, you you put boots on. They didn't have the complete outfits. That's, much as they do now, but you have the boots you put on and all. But I remember that wallowing in this pig pen with the water that and was getting it all muddy and all. I remember that he ruined the pants of his brand new suit, supposedly mm -hmm. trying to rescue these pigs. So yeah, barn fires were a big, and grass fires. They had loads and loads of grass fires in those times because you had so much open space that you don't have now. Basic firefighter now is is two what two hundred around two hundred hours two hundred hours of training or more and how do you ask somebody to leave their family weekend so a lot of times it's it's a Saturday, week, Sunday. Like Saturday or Sunday it's it's a lot to ask that's mainly why you don't get anybody to say it. the training is it's crazy the state raised the bar on it you know. And uh, the ones who do the training for uh, the county now, no education. What do you think they do? They just, everything, they want to educate. Everybody's got to have more education, never enough. The experience, really, I think. You can be educated all you want, sit in classes. It, it's, it's getting out there and doing the jobs where you learn it. That's where it is. Yep, exactly right. Times of fire, like the bad times of fires. When you, we've had a couple deaths, you know, civilian deaths. Like one night, I was chief, Denny was deputy chief. We had two, husband and wife. And it was before 8 o'clock in the night. They had a fire in their house, and they were upstairs in the bedroom. And they called it in, but they didn't make it out. They I knew the guy, Denny knew him. He li had lived up the street. We had a couple other ones. We had another one in... Uh, I drug him out. In fact, of uh, the little giant out in the brick borough. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's right. Then we did a drill afterwards and we took um, smoke, detectors. smoke detectors around all the houses to make sure that the, the residents had smoke detectors. A lot of times people forget their smoke detectors. You know. Luckily, today's smoke detectors, most of them are 10 year lithium or they're 110. Yeah, you can't take the batteries out of them. <laughs> and in today's world, anything that, like uh, townhouses, they're sprinkled. The new ones have to be sprinkled by the state law and all the codes. Remember, everybody's running out of the building and we're running. <laughs>